Hello, Georgetown. I'm Beverly Enos, and this is Spotlight Georgetown. You can find us on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Sometimes you'll find us other times, but those are the standard times for us. This is part of our cable TV productions, and if you would like to become part of it, please let me know. You can come and run the cameras or learn some of the editing or be here with me as a guest. And I would love to have you join us. Just let me know and we'll get you here and get you working. Now today we're going to be talking to Laura Heitduke, and she is from the Fisheries and Wildlife. And we're going to be talking primarily about coyotes. We've seen some of those in Georgetown, so that's what we're going to be doing. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me it's today. It's nice to have you here. Now, you're not from Georgetown. I am not. I, I actually reside in Grafton, but I'm originally from Illinois. Oh, wow. This is a big move for you. Big difference, yep. Now, what areas does a, where's your headquarters office and what area does it cover? Yep, so I'm out of the Westboro Field headquarters. Um, and actually, I cover the entire state. And then throughout the state, we have five different district offices. So up in the northeastern part of the state, our office is actually in air. So there we have a district manager and a wildlife biologist. Now you actually have a, a, t a specific title that you... I am. I am the fur bear and black bear project leader. So I work with the 14 fur bear species that we have. So that's coyotes, fisher, foxes, raccoons, skunks, and those are the most common ones. Um, and then I also work with black bear throughout the state. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Do we have a lot of them? In the western and central part of the state, yep. They're really? starting to make their way out this way. So you may occasionally see them. Oh, wow. Are they that dangerous? No. Okay. I know they have them up in New Hampshire. <laughs> I've seen them in, in dumpsters and parking lots and things exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. They're, they're just big. They're just big. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how long have you been doing this work? So I've been with the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife for a little over two years now. Um, prior to that, I was out in Illinois working on my master's degree um, where I studied long-tailed weasels, which are another one of the fur bearer species that we have here. Um, and then I was getting my undergraduate degree as well up in northern Illinois, um, working on ecology and things like that. So a now couple of years you, now. How did you ever get into this field? A lot of camping when I was a kid. Really? And a lot of interest in wildlife. So that kind of just led me in that direction. Now, I would say coyotes, but you said coyotes? Either way. Either, Either way, way is okay? fine. It kind of interchangeable depending on who you're talking to. We, we're seeing more and more of them in mm -hmm. this part of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? Really, they're found throughout the state. Um, they actually are very, very common in even the most urban settings. So we do have family groups that live in East Boston. Not a place where you'd think you'd see a large you know, dog rel relative, but um, they're very common throughout the state. A lot of times it's very seasonally dependent when you're going to see them. So this time of year, they've just finished mating. They're starting to have their pups. And so they have this litter of pups to feed. So they're out you know, hunting and feeding more frequently, bringing that food back to the dens. Um, so it's very seasonal as to when you might be seeing them you know, more often. And, and this is one of those times of year where it's going to peak. OK. How do you know it's, it's a coyote? I mean, do they look like dogs or what? Coyotes actually do look a lot like dogs. Um, a lot of people describe them as looking like a very large German shepherd, but very furry, kind of a different color. Um, a lot of people think that they're only gray, but we actually have coyotes that might range from red colors to blondes um, to even a very dark fur coat that's almost black in color. So there's a big variety in terms of their coat color that you're going to see. Um, but for the most part, they're that grizzled gray color. And they're about 45 pounds on average, although they can get bigger to about you know, 60 pounds at the top end of their weight. Um, and so they do, they look like that German shepherd-like dogs. Um, but one thing that people really note is the very pointy nose and the very pointed ears that they have, um, and just kind of the manner that they carry themselves in. It's a little bit different than your average dog running around. As if they own the world. They can, yes. <laughs> Sometimes they do have that attitude. And I've had them in my, my backyard. Yep. I live on yep. a golf course, and I've had them in the backyard. And I was on the deck, and I saw this, what originally I thought was a dog. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he looked up at me and was, oh my, I'm glad I'm up here and not outside. Yep. They're not something that you need to be intimidated by, but just have a healthy respect for them when they are out there and, and acknowledge that they are out there, especially when you have a dog or a cat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's certain ways that you can keep them safe, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Now, what do they eat? Coyotes eat a lot of different things, and that's one of the reasons they do so well in the urban and suburban areas. So they'll eat everything from small mammals, so rabbits, chipmunks, mice, squirrels, those types of things, um, to vegetables, fruits, garbage, compost, um, 
insects when they're available. Just about anything. If it's edible, a coyote could eat it. Think of them as a very big raccoon. So if a raccoon could get into it, a coyote okay. would get into it. So you'd find them a lot around trash areas and dumpsters and yeah, things like that. Yeah, especially if it's easy access to food. So if you have dumpsters that are uncovered or, you know, sometimes when raccoons get in, they're pretty messy and they throw food around. So that food's on the floor and the coyote could get to it. Um, if you have your trash just in bags on the corner, sometimes the coyotes can smell the food right through those bags. So they'll rip into it just like anything else would. Um, so those easy access to foods that attracts them a lot of times. I was wondering why this particular one was in the backyard and now I know the town garden is across the street. That could do it. So that there's could do lots it. of vegetables, mm -hmm. lots of food. That could definitely do it. And then a lot of times backyards are a very good landscape for things like rabbits. Mm -hmm. So we have typically, you know, nice mowed lawns that rabbits like to graze in, but there's cover in the shrubbery around. So they have this great little habitat for rabbits. And when you have rabbits, you a lot of times have the predators that will feed on them. So, you know, coyotes are just one of them. Yeah. And we have a lot of deer, too, because they go over and eat out of the garden. Yep. And coyotes will occasionally prey on deer. Typically, they scavenge roadkills, um, but occasionally they can prey on them. So it is an attractant, that's for sure. Right. I was uh, pulling into my garage a few weeks ago, and all of a sudden I looked up and there was deer in my driveway. Mm -hmm. And when they turned around and ran, there were six of them. Yep. Right through the gardens. Mm -hmm. Right across, mm -hmm. across the oh, golf yeah. course. Coyotes howl. Why do they, they howl? Do. They have a really nasty sound in You know, and, and a lot of people are very intimidated by the sound of howling, and it's not anything malicious, it's just their means of communication. So this time of year, you'll hear a little bit of howling. Um, in January, a lot of times people hear a lot of howling. That's the breeding season or the start of it. And so they're broadcasting their territory to other coyotes. They're advertising that they have a mate. They're advertising for a mate. They're communicating with one another. And then as you get into the summer months, you're bound to hear pups howling. So these pups are trying to learn the communication skills. They're howling back and forth with the parents. They're howling with one another. Um, and it's a little noticeable. They do sound like smaller animals. So you'll be able to tell that it's pups howling. And really, they're just communicating with one another. It's not anything malicious. They're not out to get us. They are not. They are not. How can I keep the coyotes out of my backyard or anybody's backyard? Exactly. So there's a lot of different things that we can do, and it, a lot of it goes back to that food. So if there's food, a lot of times these animals will come in. So, and this can go for any different type of animal, raccoons, foxes. When the food's available, they'll come. So making sure that you don't have bird feeders out because those a lot of times attract squirrels and chipmunks, and then the squirrels and chipmunks attract the predators. Okay. Um, making sure that garbage and compost is in very tight containers that really helps you know mask the smell of that food so they're not going to be drawn in towards that never feeding pets outside um, when people put cat food out they're not just feeding cats they're feeding coyotes foxes skunks raccoons just about anything that can get to that food so making sure those food sources aren't available is a really really important way to make sure that you're not attracting them into the yard and then since it is the denning season when they're looking for places to have their pups um, making sure that you don't have any places that they might want to den. So a lot of times people have um, holes under sheds or under decks, brush piles in the yard and things like that. Those types of places provide really, really good cover. And if we're not very active in our backyards during the winter months, the coyotes don't really view it as a disturbed area. So when we oh, come wow. out, when the weather's warm, all of a sudden you're starting to see these coyotes in the backyard as well. And so blocking off those areas using lattice work and putting rocks in places where there might be openings under sheds, um, just making sure that they can't set up shop there. That's a really, really good way of discouraging them from even moving in. And if you have a coyote denning in the yard, don't fret, you can, you can solve that problem. They're actually very, very good parents. And if there's any disturbance to the den site, they don't wanna be there. So if you have a den in your yard and you know that it's there, go out, make a lot of noise, walk around, bang pots and pans as you're walking around, talk a couple times a day, um, disturb that den site, touch everything around it, leave a lot of human scent, give it a couple days and those coyotes will move those pups to a different den site because it's not worth the risk to, to the family group. When you're doing this, you just need to make sure the mom and dad aren't there. The mom and dad, if they are there, what they'll do is run off a little bit and that's kind of designed to distract predators away from the den site. So they'll run off, they'll turn around and they'll look at you mm -hmm. and they'll try to decide what you're doing. So bang pots and pans again, you can throw a stick in their direction, anything to show them that this is not the place that they want to be. And that's okay. really helpful. The pups will stay in the den. So if I see one walking through the backyard, what do I do? Harass it, harass it, harass it. We can't stress that enough. It's very, very important because when coyotes walk into backyards, most of the time they're looking for food. 
So if a coyote comes into the backyard and I'm standing on my porch and it grabs you know, a strawberry off the bush or it finds a rabbit or a chipmunk and I just let it be and it gets that food and then it goes away, there's never any negative interaction there with the person and that coyote just got rewarded for being in the backyard. So if it comes into the backyard dog, for food, dog. exactly. And it's, it's the same type of idea that that behavior is then rewarded by actually acquiring that food source. So if it's in the backyard and you see it, bang pots and pans, go outside, make an honest effort to harass it. A lot of people will just tap on the window and that kind of thing. Coyotes learn very quickly that that doesn't mean anything. And if it's an everyday sound like a car horn, they're used to it. There's nothing negative associated with it. So go outside, if you're outside gardening, squirt it with a hose. Coyotes are used to rain, they're not used to a water hose, you know, being squirted at it or anything like that. Throw a tennis ball in its direction. When you make a lot of noise and that coyote can associate that noise with you and then you throw something in its direction, you're making that coyote feel unsafe at whatever distance it chose to be at. It's going to need to go further away to feel safe. And the more you do it, the further away it's going to need to feel safe. And what, they, what you want is them to associate your backyard with your territory. It's not their territory because they are territorial animals. They understand that. So if they associate it with your territory, that's the best thing that you can do. So vary those techniques also. Don't let them get used to any one thing. A lot of people will use air horns and whistles, but if you use an air horn and whistle over and over and over and over again, and that's all you do, and the coyote still might be getting rewarded with food, your air horn and whistle might not be as effective. So if you vary those techniques, never let them get used to any one thing. And that way, you're always doing something different. A lot of people will fill a little tin can with pennies or pebbles, shake, shake it. it, it's really, really loud, toss it when it lands, it makes a lot of noise also. Um, so those types of things are really, really important to keeping coyotes from using your backyard. They might still come through at night, but you may never know. Right, I just go inside. <laughs> <laughs> what can be done to keep the cats and dogs and little critters and kids yep. safe? So, so with coyotes, when they are using backyards, um, they can occasionally prey on cats and small domestic dogs, um, as well as domestic livestock, so chickens and things like that. Um, cats are best kept safe by keeping them indoors. When cats come outside, they are subject to a lot of different things. Coyotes are just one of them. So keeping yeah. cats indoors is really the best way to keep them, safe, um, keep them safe. They're predators themselves when they're outside in the environment, but they're not the top predator, and so they are vulnerable to a few different things. Um, so keeping them indoors, best thing that you can do and never feeding cats outside because that does draw in a lot of other animals. Um, the best way to keep dogs safe is to keep them leashed and supervised. So with those small dogs, um, it's very important that they're associated directly with you. So when you're outside and a coyote sees that dog, it's going to see you with it. You're the intimidating thing. A very tiny dog might be looked at as food. So you want it to associate that dog with you and that way that dog is off limits. If the dog is completely at the other side of the yard, there's a chance that the coyote could see the dog before it would ever notice that you're there. So you want to just avoid that from happening. And with a lot of dogs, they can be very protective of their owners too. So if a coyote comes into the yard, we have had instances where dogs will go after that coyote. And then that's never good for either of the animals. And so keeping it on its leash, then you're preventing that from happening as well. Um, now with those larger dogs, a lot of times people kind of have a false sense of security that big dogs are always safe. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily the case because there are times when coyotes could view big dogs as a competitor, so an invader in their territory. So keeping your big dog on a leash and supervised as well is just really the best way to avoid any of those types of conflicts. A lot of people fence their yards to make sure that the dogs are safe. Would the coyotes bother to get through the fence? Or? You know, it really depends on the type of fencing that you have and how high the fencing is. So in terms of fencing, um, if it's typically about five feet, that's about the maximum that a coyote could jump. If it's chain link fence, they actually can climb that pretty easily. Mm. So if there's an attractant in the yard that could mean a dog, it could mean you know bird feeders with squirrels at them and things like that. Um, they could jump over the fence or they can dig under it if there's the drive to get to whatever's on the other side. So that is possible. Mm -hmm. um, if you do have fencing that is about five feet tall or a little bit under five feet tall and it is chain link, you can add a roll bar to the top of it. And basically, okay. you just have a, a wire that runs from the corners with a PVC pipe that dangles on it. So when the coyote gets to the top, they just roll right off roll right off. They can never actually pull themselves up and over the fence. So that's a really good way um, to keep those types of animals safe within a fenced in area. But it's still important to keep them supervised as much as you possibly can yeah. because 
there's a lot of other different types of wildlife that they could potentially come in contact with. Now I have an underground fence, an electric fence. Mm -hmm. That does no good for the coyotes. It does not. Mm -hmm. It does not. The coyote's not wearing that collar. So <laughs> we, we've had people say that where they, you know, the first instinct is, but I have an electric fence. And it's not actually an electric fence. It's right. just something that is on the dog. Um, and all that does is keep the dog in the yard. So if the dog would be going after the coyote, it'll keep your dog in the yard for the most part. Um, but it definitely doesn't deter the coyote in any way. So again, that keeping them supervised is, is very, very important. So if the dog is on the leash, the coyote sees the leash, the dog, and the human. Absolutely. And we're Ab scarier to them than he is to us? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's hard to believe because they're really not, not happy looking. No, they're not. They're, they're not necessarily brazen animals or anything like that. When they get rewarded for being in a human mm -hmm. setting, so when they get that type of food, there is times when they do slowly lose their fear of people. And so that's what we want to avoid from happening. If you don't feed them, that's not going to happen. When you harass them, they're not going to lose their fear of people. And so that's why it's really effective to do all those different things for everybody's benefit. Harass them, don't feed them. Um, make sure that they know they're not welcome in your yard. And that way they do keep a healthy fear of people. And when you're out there with the dog, yeah, they see you and they just don't want any part of it. Yeah. Now, with other small animals, if the coyote is out during the day, mm -hmm. does that mean that it has rabies or the, is it just looking for food? It's definitely just looking for food. Or it's patrolling its territory, it's going back to the den to be with the pups, anything along those lines. Um, they're typically most active around sunrise and sunset. So that's when you're most likely to see them. It's like the deer. E exactly, exactly. When they're newer in a human dominated landscape, so if it's the first family group that's moving into a more urban setting, a lot of times they're more nocturnal, so they're more active at night because they're trying to avoid people. Okay. But as they get used to the sights and sounds of people, the smells of people, they start learning the area and things like that, they definitely can be active at any time. So that doesn't mean that they're rabid in any way. That's a big misconception. Even with raccoons, if they're active during the day, it doesn't mean they're sick. How do you tell if they are sick? So one of the signs that you look for, for rabies in particular, um, it's a neurological disorder. So partial paralysis, the animal's dragging its back legs. Really? Um, at times they may be stumbling. They almost appear as if they're kind of in a stupor. They can't walk straight. Um, they'll oftentimes stare into space and that, that stare can't be broken by even making noise. Um, the typical foaming at the mouth that mm -hmm. you think of with rabies mm -hmm. does happen in some cases, but it doesn't happen in every case. So that's not the only thing to look for. But a lot of times that's stumbling behavior um, or unprovoked aggressive behaviors. We've had instances um, in particular with foxes or raccoons or right. skunks where they're attacking car tires or you know an inanimate object, wow. something that they would never naturally be preying on, they're aggressive with those types of things. So those unprovoked aggressive behaviors are definitely something that you would want to look for. If you do see that in any animal, you can contact the environmental police or your town police um, and ask that they come in and try to remove that animal. Okay. I can see the police officers now. <laughs> they wouldn't be real happy about that phone call. Environmental police, that's what they're there for also. So they definitely can respond if they have somebody in the area. Um, with rabies, if an animal's exhibiting signs, it typically isn't going to live longer than 10 days. So it is always a fatal disease. So if you do see an animal exhibiting those signs, count 10 days from that time period and that animal should be dead from the disease. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. If there are kids out playing, what should they do if they see a coyote? Yep, so obviously keeping kids supervised is very, very important, mm -hmm. but depending on the age of the kids, um, they might be outside by themselves without adult supervision. And if they do see a coyote, the best thing that they can do is make themselves look bigger. So if they have a jacket on, if it's the winter time, unzip that jacket and open it up. That right there makes you look twice as large. You look like an adult then. Wave your arms above your head, you look bigger. Um, coyotes don't prey on people. They're not aggressive towards people, okay. except in very, very rare circumstances. But you don't want the child harassing the coyote. They just need to slowly back away. Don't run away. When you run in front of animals, if anybody, if you have a dog and you have no. a dog, so when you run in front of your dog, the first thing your dog wants to do is follow you. Yeah, it's a game. Exactly. And the same thing with wild animals, their instinct is to follow, which is, is in and of itself is going to be very intimidating. So just slowly back away, find an adult, and that adult should then go outside and harass that coyote, you know, bang the pots and pans, throw a tennis ball at it, that type of thing. But it's not something where kids should be afraid to play outside, you know, knowing that coyotes are in the neighborhood, but just that they're aware of it. And especially it's important to teach kids not to approach any animal. Um, even if it's a domestic dog or a domestic cat, if they don't know the animal, 
Um, or if it's not with a person, don't approach that animal because we do have cases where domestic cats test positive for rabies. Um, and we've had instances where people are bitten by dogs. So it does happen. And you just need to be aware that don't approach animals you don't know. And that kind of covers the domestic and wildlife end of things because coyotes could look like a dog to some kids. Yeah. So just don't go up to anything you don't know. Especially if they're the pups. They just look absolutely, cute and warm and fuzzy. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, and that's the case a lot of times. People think they're a puppy and or they think that you know somebody dropped off a litter. Um, so don't approach anything you don't know. Um, and especially for kids, just, you know, it's the safest way. Don't pet things you don't know. Are there any of the other animals that are around at this time of year we should be concerned about? I or actually any time of year. Yeah, I wouldn't be concerned about any of the wildlife species that we have in this state, but it's one of those things to just be aware of that they're there or that they're potentially there. So in this area, you definitely have fisher. A lot of people um, call them fisher cats. Fisher cats. And uh, they're actually a large member of the weasel family. So, yep, they're, they're not related to cats at all. They do have retractable claws like cats, so it's thought that maybe that's where the name Fisher Cat comes from. Um, okay. They're not aggressive towards people. They're aggressive towards squirrels and rabbits and things like that. And they howl as well. They don't, actually. A lot oh, of people I they think did. that they scream. Yeah. Um, they make chortle sounds and chuckling sounds, and um, they can growl and hiss and things like that. Um, but when you hear something screaming in the woods, a lot of times people describe it as it sounds like a woman crying. Yeah. That's often foxes. Foxes have a variety of different vocalizations, um, and you definitely have the potential for foxes here. Um, you have bobcats in this area, um, raccoons, skunks, all those types of things. You may get the occasional black bear wandering through the area. Um, we had them wandering through North Andover last year um, and up into Methuen and things like that. So they're definitely around. Just knowing that they're there, knowing to keep a healthy distance from wildlife, and knowing that you should never feed wild animals, that, that pretty much covers all your bases and will solve any problems that you might have there. I was in Banff a while back, mm -hmm. and up there the elk are so friendly that you go into a store and they would follow you in the store. Mm -hmm. And we never want animals Huge. to get that way. Right. Because that, that type of thing, that's called habituation. And what that means, it's just a very technical term for they've lost their fear of people. So the quickest way to have an animal habituated to people is when it's fed and there's no negative interactions. Okay. So a lot of times, especially in areas where you have tourists coming in and they want to see the animals and they want to take pictures of the animals, throwing at the occasional you know, sandwich draws those animals in. And we've had that happen here with black bear and coyotes. People think they're beautiful, they want to take a picture of them. So they'll toss out a, you know, a bag of potato chips. The animal comes in, they eat the potato chips, it goes away on its own. But right there, there's no negative interaction, and that person rewarded that animal for coming close. Now, uh, we see a lot of feral cats in the area, mm -hmm. and usually that's how people domesticate the feral cats. Mm -hmm. They keep feeding them, and eventually the cat right. just says, okay, I live here. Right. So it's the same idea. It is the, the exact same idea. If there's food there, and there's no negative interaction for coming closer, of course the animal's going to come in. It's an easy meal. And so you see that with a lot of different things. Even raccoons, when you go into campgrounds, sometimes you notice raccoons yeah. that just hang around the dumpsters. It's because they know food's easy to get to. So avoiding that type of behavior, avoiding actually causing animals to behave that way, is really the best way to keep them safe. Because if we have animals that get bold and are exhibiting those behaviors, those are the type of animals that we would have to remove. So you don't want it to ever get that way. It just keeps people and animals in harmony. So we need to keep our yards clean of all the brush and the in the food and things like that. Yep. Yep. If we do see them, make a lot of noise. Absolutely. Terrorize them more than they do Harass that to us. Them. Exactly. Just make them uncomfortable for being in the area. And other than that, we shouldn't be afraid of them. Nope. Nope. Enjoy the sight of them coming through the yard on on occasion when you do harass them. Um, a lot of these animals, they're elusive. So fisher, bobcat, those types of things. A lot of people never get any opportunity to see them. So if you do see them, count yourself lucky. Um, with coyotes, if they're using the area, just think of the ecological services that they provide. You know, they're keeping rodent populations down. They can benefit nesting songbirds by keeping some of those nest predators down. And so they do have very important ecological roles as well. Um, but avoiding creating those conflicts and you'll be able to live in perfect harmony with them. Wow. That's a bunch of information that I never knew before. <laughs> it is. It is. And all that type of information is available on our website, which is um, www.mass.gov slash mass wildlife because we are a state agency. Um, we have living with wildlife fact sheets on all the different types of animals you might encounter. 
um, in your backyard setting. How to live with them, what to do so that you're not feeding them, um, what to do when you see them and things like that. And then each district um, has a district office. So we have five district offices throughout the state. Um, in this area, it is the AIR office. So you can always give them a call if you have any questions or give us a call in Westboro and we have biologists that can answer any of the questions that you might have about these different species. Oh, that was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I want to thank you for joining yeah. me. Thanks for having me. It was me. great to have you. I'm Beverly Enos. This is Spotlight Georgetown. Don't forget, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Thank you for joining us. Bye for now.